This is the second talk in a series of seven. It was first given on the 29th of March 2006 and is being given today, Monday the 14th of December 2015. It is a biological literary criticism on the topic of handedness. Scraping the surface of the scientific field asymmetry in nature, we look at three modern theories on human sidedness. One, the two type theory. Two, the pathological continuums embracing normal populations theory. Three, the right shift theory. We then move to the ancient world and give a quick sketch of how the ancients understand hand preference and mention a fourth theory, game theory, which best helps to clarify the ancient ideas. Finally, we look at Statius Thebaid and demonstrate how basic biological ideas can undergo strange, but still evolutionary, transformations when rhetorical sophistication comes into play. The concept of left and right handedness, why is Statius so side specific? Imagine a planet in a galaxy far, far away where God has decreed that 10% of a human-like population be left-handed and that 90% be right-handed. On this faraway planet, Mother Nature has decreed that 10% of all humanoids, both left and right-handed, be afflicted with a neurological pathology in the dominant cerebral hemisphere, the hemisphere containing the brain's principal machinery. This inclines or even necessitates a person so afflicted to switch his or her preferred hand. So instead of the 10 to 90% breakdown instituted by God, 1% of the left-handers will have shifted right and 9% of the right-handers will have shifted left leaving a breakdown of 18%, 10 minus one plus nine, left-handers, and 82%, 90 minus, one minus nine plus one, right-handers. As time passes on this distant planet, left-handers start to get a bad reputation. One, popularly, two in religion, and three with people who write academic papers on handedness. And no wonder. One in two of the left-handers are brain damaged, whereas only one in 82 of the right-handers are so damaged. One, uh, nine out of 18, or one out of 82. I'm setting forth my parable of the distant planet because if you were to exchange God for genes and mother nature for pregnancy and birth complications and other developmental or maturational anomalies and also change the percentage figures a little, you would be looking at something suspiciously very close to the whole picture of a theory that has had a long run in the 20th and 21st centuries thinking on handedness. It is called the two-type view of left-handedness. First type, non-pathological, or natural, or genetic, and second type, pathological. Yes, suspiciously close to the two-type theory of left-handedness, but there is one major adjustment that needs to be made, and that is that on the planet far away, impairment led to 100% conversion for hand use, whereas on this planet, it is thought that the cerebral dominance insult, especially of the less significant kind, is a randomizing factor for handedness. Think instead of a more usual 50% hand use conversion. This theory largely appears with Brain in the 1940s. Yes, there was a 20th century neurologist called Brain. The theory was substantially revived by Satz in the 1970s, and the theory still exists in various forms today not least amongst left-handers themselves. A left-hander can argue that the genuinely pathological left-handers are, on the whole, blow-ins from the right-hander camp. Adding, of course, 
and there is not much wrong with me, pal. There are, however, serious problems for the two-type theory of left-handedness, in particular for the idea of natural or true or genetic left-handedness. Number one, after years of genetic research, nobody's been able to find two genes for handedness. One for left-handedness, one for right-handedness. A gene which gears us up for right-handedness has however been theorized, and more on that in due course. But no one has found or is theorizing a gene for left-handedness or left-sidedness. Problem number two for the two-type theory of left-handedness is that there is no straight genetic link anyhow. First of all, studies on parents who are, for instance, both left-handers show that their children are not statistically different from the general population with regard to handedness. Also, monozygotic twins can be differently handed. Monozygotic meaning from the same zygote, so having exactly the same genetic makeup. And there is a further matter. When one hears statements like, there is some lots of left-handedness in our family history, it is not clear as to whether what is being passed on can be considered in any core way genetic. The family members might be engaging in punching each other in the head, or they may be living in an area where there is something in the water. Problem number three for the two-type theory of left-handedness, this begins principally with Paul Buchan in the 1970s. In 1971, a single-page article by Buchan appeared in Nature magazine which reported that in a study of male college students, there was a statistically significant correlation between left-handedness and firstborns, and also with children further down the birth order ranks, think fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. And that the author's tentative hypothesis was that the mother was under greater stress with first and later births. Amongst people interested in handedness at this time, i.e. almost nobody, this paper caused a sensation. Prior to this, nobody had really taken seriously the idea that left-handedness was a marker for underlying pathologies in normal populations. The race was on and in two directions. First and foremost, there is a shift of focus for handedness study onto mothers. Birth and birth complications, to what precisely is going on in the womb, to hormones and to immune systems. The second shift in focus is away from gross pathology and away from clinical populations. Notice in connection with this latter, some of the nearly negligible personality defects and minor medical conditions being correlated with left-handedness in my list of studies, mostly from the 1980s. Consider for instance, less likely to marry, more likely to divorce allergies, and alexithymia, the inability to express emotions. It is worth noting briefly just how startling the, figure, the findings of some of these post pecan article studies were. I draw your attention to two studies on premature birth, Ross, 1987, and O'Callaghan, also 1987. In the first of these studies, the babies weighed less than 1,500 grams, and when tested for handedness at four years of age, 63% were right-handed, 17% mixed-handed, and 19% left-handed. A very high incidence of left-handedness. In the second study, the babies weighed less than 1,000 grams. Think of a kilo packet of sugar that you would buy in a shop. Less than that. When tested four years later, 54% left-handed. You can also see from the list a further development. The new scrutiny of pathology in normal populations gave the researchers dealing with gross pathologies a new slant on their own problem. And there's something of a boom in their studies as well. And this type of study is still going strong today. As a matter of fact, whilst I was preparing this paper on Monday, March the 13th, 2006 to be precise, the Australian newspaper ran a story that Dutch scientists had completed a study which found that there was double the incidence of left-handedness in women with breast cancer. In the 1990s, however, there is a growing feeling that all this emphasis on pathology might have gone too far. 
With a resurgence of interest in Darwinism, there comes a tendency to see the world in terms of a cold struggle to survive rather than the healthy being afflicted by the pathological. Example, when someone is born with a sixth finger, we say that's a pathological birth. But Mother Nature says, I was just trying something different. That's how evolution proceeds. It is with this slightly altered atmosphere in mind that we move to our third and final theory of handedness, that of Marianne Annette. This is an important graph for Annette's theory. Here are the gorilla's chimps etc. who display handedness but in no per particular direction. They're right along the axis, right here, left here, mixed in the middle. And here's us. We'll say at the outset that we are interested in Annette's theory of the right shift, but that we think her ideas about normal distribution curves are most unfortunate and that such ideas are flirting with the truism that things are as they are except when they are slipping away to be not themselves and contrariwise that things are random until they are not. Furthermore, what is an extreme right-hander? And what is the median right-handed person going to be like? Do such mathematically based conceptions have any meaning at all for the real world? What however is good about the right shift theory is that it brings the rest of the animal world into theorizing about sightedness. And as sociobiologists, we give this a very big tick. Also, it brings deep history and evolution into theorizing about handedness. And as evolutionary psychologists and psychiatrists, we give this another very big tick. To just explain this theory quickly, we are a species that is deliberately bred for left cerebral dominance so that we can be good at language, heavily concentrated in the left hemisphere. The breeding project has resulted in a nurturing, cultivation, privileging of the right side of the body, has resulted in us being somewhat extraordinarily the right hand specialists. Now to produce a perfect right shifted normal distribution curve, all this has to have been masterminded by the genes. And Annette does theorize a right shift gene. So where does the problem arise? Well, whatever the expression normal means in the expression normal distribution curve, it can't mean that for humans, normal and healthy people are evenly distributed throughout the graph because we know that way too many people in the left-handed population have serious mental afflictions as per the list of studies. No worries, says Marion Annette, that can be easily explained. For reasons that we don't fully understand yet, only 80% of the human population has the right shift gene and the other 20% form and I think you'll have guessed this already, yes, another normal distribution curve, back with the gorillas and bonobos, etc. But how can she get away with all this? Well, there are two steps involved. Firstly, she denies that there is a high level of pathology associated with left-handedness by saying that, one, newer studies have found less or little or no correlation between mental illnesses, pathological behaviors and left-handedness, and two, that studies that don't find any correlation don't attract press or even academic interest. But secondly, and here's where things start to get interesting, she says th there are, however, some mental illnesses that fit perfectly with her failure to lateralize theory, i.e. the failure to move right. These are schizophrenia, some sorts of autism, and in the more minor category pathologies, dyslexia, stuttering, and stammering. Now, it is well known that one very peculiar aspect of schizophrenic 
neurology is a lack of any cerebral dominance and that this applies to some autistics. And with dyslexia, the brain is having a problem which turns on precisely this que question, which came first, left or right? Again, with stuttering and stammering, it is thought the brain is being flooded with information from both hemispheres and it is having trouble assigning precedence during the inundation. So what are we to make of Annette's ideas? With regard to the first argument, she is never going to be able to wish away the pathological connection for left-handedness. There are just too many studies. But with regard to her second argument, there is something of major interest for the behavioral ecologist and evolutionist. Her focus on the genuinely pathological ambilaterals provides a clue to the fact that our right-shifted species has had to pay a debt, so to speak, for adopting the extreme and unexampled in nature evolutionary step of producing brains that are so lopsided. The debt is a high level of mental illness. The neurologically ambilateral, those who have, quotes, failed to make the shift, to being homo weirdo righty ends and who are not therefore effectively adapted for language use are ipso facto human monkey or even human monkey. Non-participants, non-eligibles and casualties for the risky evolutionary project of being right-sided. Part two, A. Ancient ideas about handedness. With a biolit analysis, you would think that you would only need two steps. One, look at the relevant biology, and two, look at the literary theme or motif that you're interested in. Perhaps periodically you move back to biology for clarification of an issue. In the case of handedness, however, I think we need an intermediate step a step in which we try to get a grasp of how people in antiquity actually understood handedness. So in this second part of the paper, we're going to look at the ancient conception of left and right handedness. There are very few references to handedness in antiquity. In fact, I've only been able to find four substantial ones, all of them to left handedness, two biblical, one from early Roman history and one from the biographer Suetonius. I would like to begin with and actually spend some time on one particular passage. It is from the Bible, Judges 19.10 to 20.17. The reason we are going to take some time on this passage is because I think that this single passage, passage can tell us a very great amount about what we need to know. The Levite rose up and departed from Bethlehem and arrived opposite Jebus. That is Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled asses and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was far spent and the servant said to his master, come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his servant, come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no man took them into his house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjaminites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city, and the old man said, where are you going? And whence do you come? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem into Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to my home. 
and nobody takes me into his house. We have straw and provender for our asses with bread and wine for me and your maidservant and the young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants, only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and gave the asses provender. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, base fellows, beset the house round about, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, do not act so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do so vile a thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. And her master rose up in the morning and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, Behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. Then he put her upon the ass and the man rose up and went away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife and laying hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel and speak. Chapter 20. Then all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly to the people of God, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. Now the Benjaminites heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. And the people of Israel said, tell us, how was this wickedness br brought to pass? And the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin and I and my concubine to spend the night. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about me by night. They meant to kill me and they ravished my concubine and she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. For they have committed abomination and wantedness in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, all of you, give your advice and counsel here. And all the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand and a thousand of 10,000 to bring provisions for the people. What, that when they come, they may requite Gibeah of Benjamin for all the wanton crime which they have committed in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, united as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying, what wickedness is this that has taken place among you now? Now, therefore, give up the men, the base fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But the Benjaminites would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the people of Israel, and the Benjaminites came together out of the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the Benjaminites mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men that drew the sword, 
besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered 700 picked men. Among all these were 700 picked men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of war. This passage is a striking one. I, for instance, think it's probably one of the most disgusting episodes in the entire Bible. But there are a number of puzzling aspects regarding what is being described in the story. And I draw your attention to three notable illogicalities in the text. First, at 19.29, the Levite cuts the concubine up into 12 pieces, but he should have cut her up into only 11 pieces, since it is presumably only the other 11 tribes that need to know the news. Now, this might have been only a small detail or an irrelevant mistake but for the fact that at the beginning of chapter 20, it becomes a material concern. Who assembled at Mizpah? Not only are we told that all the tribes of Israel turned up at Mizpah, but we are told this three times. So did the Benjaminites turn up for the meeting or didn't they? And if they did, why didn't the war start straight away? An editor or redactor has become nervous about this and at 23 adds in a parenthetic or explanatory gloss, now the Benjaminites heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. So the idea is now something like that the Benjaminites got to within a discreet distance of Mizpah and somehow listened in on proceedings. Illogicality number two is at 29, which begins but now this is what we will do to Gibeah. When we read this sentence and then get to the rather cumbersome expounding of the one in 10 ratios, I think we modern readers are already guessing that this passage is going to refer to troop numbers and that we are going to be told something like that only a 10th of the warrior populations of the 11 tribes will be required to deal with a single tribe of Benjamin. But instead, it turns out to be about the catering Something terribly wrong seems to have occurred in the transmission of this part of the story. Illogicality number three is in connection with the actual 700 left-handed men. And the Benjaminites mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men that drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who mustered 700 picked men. 2015. That sentence makes perfect sense to me. There were 26,000 Benjaminites and there were 700 Gibeans. Total, 26,700. Then comes 2016. Among all these were 700 picked men. Among all whom? And who is this second lot of 700 picked men? I think we can cut a long story short here. The redactor has had two versions of a story in front of him, both considered authoritative. In one, the 700 men are from all over Benjamin. In the other, the 700 men are an exclusively Gibeon contingent. In a way that is characteristic of biblical composition, the redactor, who can't decide which is the more authoritative version, just sticks them both into the text. Flush up against each other and with no explanation. So they are the illogicalities. I'm going to suggest that despite these illogicalities, or even better still because of them, what is on the mind of the author of the Levite's concubine story is very clear. It is very clear because it is something that has been on the author's mind right throughout the book of Judges. And before I say precisely what that is, let me just remind you of where we are in the Bible. In the book of the Bible before Judges, the book of Joshua, Joshua leads the Israelites into and throughout Canaan, wiping out whole native races. And these exterminations are described in language of the most explicit kind. In Judges, however, these exterminated races, and here's another illogicality, start to reappear. Not only do they reappear, they seem to be quite happily occupying the major towns and cities of Canaan. Consider the Jebusites in our very own passage. 
dwelling in a very, or even the most, notable city, Jerusalem. Now this anomalous state of affairs requires an explanation, and in this very theological book, the answer is inevitably a theological one. God has deliberately put these people in Canaan, and especially in its towns and cities, as a test for the Israelites. See Judges 3, 1 and 3, 4. They are to be a military test for the Israelites to keep them sharp, and they are also to be something of a moral test with their one foreign gods, two foreign cults, three foreign women, four foreign customs. This problematic state of affairs becomes the abiding concern for the writer of Judges. He is thinking about parts and holes. In particular, he's thinking about the effect of having a polluted part in an otherwise healthy whole. In the bulk of the text of Judges, it is the pollution of these remnant native peoples living within the healthy whole of the nation of Israel. But when we get to Judges 19.10, this entire preoccupation takes an ironic turn. Staying a night with the Jebusite scum in Jerusalem is passed over for a safe night spent with one's own brethren. But what a night it turns out to be. The focus here in 1910 to 2017 has moved sharply onto the internal pollution of Israel by the Gibeans and their version of hospitality. The illogicalities, to get back to them, are therefore all indicative traces of an earlier, more purely theological text where parts were more directly ranged against holes. 1 verses 12 at 1929, 1 verses 10 in a population of warriors at 29, and 700 verses 26,000 for the Benjaminite army at 2015. And now we come, at long last, to the 700 left-handed men themselves. In the Hebrew original, what has been translated here as left-handed is ita yad yemino. Yad means hand, yemino means right, and Itter means something like impeded, shut up, or maimed. So what we have here at a literal level is a contingent of men with damaged right hands. There can't, however, be much doubt about the translation of Itter Yad Yemeno as left-handed because the term is used on one other occasion in the Bible, Ehud's story at Judges 3.15, where the meaning has to be having the condition of being left-handed. And by blending the two accounts of the 700 men, the 700 left-handers can be specifically linked to the town of Gibeah and its abominations. But who exactly are the 700 blended left-handers from Gibeah? And why are being, we being told about them? My answer is that principally, the contingent of 700 stone slingers is a military sideshow. Why this interpretation? First, consider the locution at 23, the description of the 400,000 men who turn up at Mizpah. 400,000 men on foot who drew the sword. And then that of the Benjaminites, excluding the 700. At 2015, 26,000 that drew the sword. And notice especially 2017, and the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 that drew the sword. All these were men of war. The author is hammering the point, just in case we're not paying attention, that the Israelite army and even the 26,000 Benjaminites are real men, real warriors. The 700 left-handed men are not in this category. They are a second tier fighting force something of a sideshow. What, however, has to be weighed up against their inferior status is that, first of all, there are 700 of them. Despite being only 2.7% of the Benjaminite force, 700 is a lot. Moreover, numbers with a seven in them in the Bible are for politically significant entities. There are, for instance, 70 men in a religious or political council. Also to be weighed in favor of the 700 is the accuracy of their stone slinging. They must therefore be having some success in battle. So what 
finally, can we say we have found out about these 700 men and their left-handedness? That they are perverted, partially disabled, second-class fighters who have some significance as a socio-political phenomenon and who have a certain scary cunning. It is a weird portrait, but I believe that the depiction of these men is a major insight into how people in antiquity understand handedness. It can be summed up like this. People in antiquity have almost no sense of our modern clinical and essentialist ideas of left and right handedness. What we call right handedness is for them normal, healthy, God approved behavior. What is called by us left handedness is for them the failure to be right handed and by implication the failure to be normal the failure to be healthy and finally to be in disfavor with God or the gods. The one redeeming feature of the left-hander is a preternatural and surprising cunning. B, game theory. The question to ask at this point is, did the modern theories of handedness help us with the problem of understanding the ancient world's conceptualizing of handedness? The answer I think is yes, but only in the most general sense of elucidating why left-handedness is linked to that which is pathological, and I think we can do better. Let's look at, this, that, at a strand of bi sociobiological thinking that theorists seem reluctant to use on the problem of handedness, and that is game theory. Game theory is about metaphorical hawks and doves, sometimes about hawks, doves and bourgeois, about non-cooperators and cooperators. In the animal world, it can be about carnivores and herbivores, predators and herds. But also it can be about dominant strategies versus minority or niche strategies. Game theory, it seems to me, is especially relevant in a consideration of the ancient conceptualization of left-handedness. It is present in our story of the 700 men who unleash stones because they are adopting a determined minority strategy but one in which, in which in certain circumstances might prove effective. And this idea carries on importantly into the David and Goliath story, where David, one of the greatest heroes of Jewish tradition, is himself just such a stone slinger, and where he is definitely not the favorite to win. What about our other three stories of ancient left-handers? With both Ehud, the early judge of Israel, Judges 3.15, and Caius Mucius Scevola in Livy, early history of Rome, 2.12, you have the improbable situation of a person of no special importance who gets up close to and kills or terrorizes someone who is an extremely important person. In the Ehud story, the murder is a complete success, as is his escape. With the Scevola story, although he doesn't kill the right person, the murder committed turns out to be a great success. Of major interest to us is the fact that there is a scene which affords the opportunity for a detailed expounding of Scevola's desperation and of his terrorist tactics. Scevola, having burnt his own right arm to indicate his complete indifference to pain of any kind and willingness to pay any price to get his own way, tells the Etruscan king Porsena that there are 299 other assassins ready to attack him, even if he, Scevola, fails. This tactic works. Porsena packs up, raises the siege of Rome and leaves. In terms of game theory, it is a straight case of a hawk threatening a hawk and the latter retreating with his life, army and possessions and playing bourgeois. It is probably appropriate to mentioned parenthetically at this point that there is a relevance for all this to our own time where Abu Masa al-Zakawi and Osama bin Laden, the terrorists and assassins of today, both of whom are left-handed, are playing exactly the same get up close with socio-politically inconsequential desperados game. But back to the ancient world. Our final case is Suetonius's Life of Tiberius. I would have to say that I don't have any clear mental image of Suetonius as Tiberius. He's a paradoxical entity. He's a sober and educated man who can be cruel and perverted in an instant. He is an exile and a recluse, but he is someone who fits in with common soldiers and can be at the center of the prosecution of large scale wartime exploits. 
I am left wondering whether his left-handedness in section 68 is supposed to indicate completely in line with game theory that he is the difficult person, always coming up with the surprises. Someone, of course, might object that in Suetonius we are just being told that he was incidentally a left-handed person, but I'm not sure that there are too many, if any, people in antiquity who are in a position to make that interpretation. Part three, Statius. Statius is a late first century author who wrote a text that treats in substance the old tale of the seven against Thebes. In Statius Thebaid, there is a persistent and pointed specification of side. That is a specification of whether something is on the left or on the right. There are at least 30 of these. They are located in books 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. Most of these references are to a hand or hands, 20 of the 30. Statius' plan is to employ the pointed specifications of side as part of a moral superstructure. In the superstructure, left means weak or decrepit or out of place or evil. Right means strong, healthy, appropriate or good. But interestingly, morality is not his only concern. Of greater concern in Statius are two types of scene. The scene that depicts extreme hubris and the scene that depicts extreme pathos. The depictions of hubris and pathos are however so extreme that the significance of left and right can change. Strong or at least reliance on strength alone can end up meaning bad. And weak or out of place can end up meaning healthy, good or charming. These inversions are owing respectively to the moral prohibition regarding taking war too far and to the pathos aroused by impotence or immaturity. So let's see all this in action. Passage 1, Book 1, 303 to 308. Obedient to his father's word, the grandson of Atlas straightway fastens on his ankles the winged sandals and with wide hat veils his locks and tempers the brilliance of the stars. Then he took in his right hand the wand wherewith he was wont to dispel or call again sweet slumber, wherewith to enter the gates of gloomy Tartarus or summon back dead souls to life. In passage one, Jupiter has sent the grandson of Atlas, namely Mercury, his own son and his right hand man, down to earth to fetch the shade of Laius and with that wishes to engender a falling out between the brothers, Eteocles and Polynices, so a war can begin. And it is that falling out and the subsequent war that will be the main plot of the Thebaid. Now, how can I justify the interpretation right-hand man for Mercury, which is not in the text? Well, if we go back a short time before this, Jupiter, using the word descendo, one, two, two, five, states that he is going down to earth to start the war, but he doesn't do any such thing. He sends down instead his son, making right hand man a sort of suppressed term in the text. So what we have therefore in this passage is the right hand man carrying in his right hand an object that contains ultimate power over life and death. What this all amounts to is a substantial insight into Greco-Roman theology. Where does power reside? Answer, with the gods, and more particularly with the head male god. How does it get down to earth? Via the head god's right hand man, held in his right hand, until it ends up in your right hand. In short, the right hand equals power and life. Passage 2, Book 8, 736 to 760. Have pity, sons of Inarchus. I pray not that my bones be taken to Argos or my Aetolian home. I care not for funeral obsequies. I hate my limbs and my body so frail and useless, deserter of the soul within it. Thy head, thy head, O Melanippus, could one but bring that, bring me that, for thou art groveling on the plain. So indeed I trust, nor did my valour fail me at the last. Go, Hippomedon, I beg, if thou hast aught of Atreus' blood, go thou Arcadian, youth, 
renowned in thy first wars, and thou, O Capenius, mightiest now of all the Argive host. All were moved, but Capenius first duts away, and finding the son of Astarchus, lifts him still breathing from the dust, and returns with him on his left shoulder, staining his back with blood from the stricken wound. In such wise did the Tyrinthian return from the Arcadian lair, when he brought home to applauding Argos the captive, the captive boar. Tidius raises himself and turns his gaze upon him, then mad with joy and anger. When he saw them drag the gasping visage and saw his handiwork therein, he bids them cut off and hand to him his foe's fierce head, and seizing it in his left hand, he gazes at it and glows to see it still warm in life and the wrathful eyes still flickering ere they closed. Content was the wretched man, but avenging Tisiphone demands yet more. And now her sire appeased, had Tritonia come and was bringing immortal luster to the unhappy hero, when lo, she sees him befouled with brains. Passage two. This is a passage of extreme hubris and deals with Tidius as evil incarnate. What Greek would not want his dead body to be taken to his homeland for burial? The answer given here is, only one that is so pathologically given over to bloodlust that he has no cognition of anything beyond it. In this passage, Tidius, the principal Argive fighter and killing machine, is intent on exacting revenge on Melanippus, a Theban fighter who has downed him with a spear. Tidius has just enough life remaining in him to cast his own spear to bring Melanippus down. His fellow fighter Capanius, under instruction, retrieves the body and cuts the head off. Tidius lifts the head up with his left hand, indicating that he's pure evil, and then eats the brains to underline the fact that he's departed from all civilized norms. Tritonia, Athena, who was about to bestow immortality on him, has to run away in disgust. The other nice touch worth noting with regard to left symbolism is that Capanius brings the body of Melanippus back on his left shoulder. This is because in the ensuing battle, Hippomedon and he are going to function as fighters who are filled with Tidious evil spirit. They are, here's another suppressed term, his left-hand men. The portrait of Hippomedon as an evil stand-in for Tidious is very clear. At 9, 138, when he lops off Leontis', Leontis right hand, as that man tries to grab Tidious' corpse, Hippomedon shouts out, it is Tidious, Tidious, himself who robs thee of it. There are two points to make here. One, Hippomedon is claiming to be a reincarnation of Tidious. And two, that whilst cutting off a hand in battle is not in itself evil, boasting about it probably is. Thereafter, Hippomedon is involved in a number of hubristic or off-color or anti-god acts. He at one point fights with such ferocity that he scarcely distinguishes friend from foe, 9199. He attacks twins, 9292. And twins are always supposed to command our sympathy in Statius because they represent perfect brotherly harmony. He attacks and kills a friend of the goddess Diana, 9304. Anti god behavior. He kills a number of people who don't sound like professional warriors and who, as such, are supposed to deserve our sympathy. 9305 and following. Finally, he attacks nature itself in the form of a sacred river and kills the youthful river dwelling deity Craneus, whose last pathos arousing word is mother. Passage 3, Book 9, 546 to 551. Great-hearted Capanius knew him from afar and mastered his rage, and poising a huge gap javelin uh, with his arm, thus prays, Help me now, right arm of mine, my only present aid in battle and deity irresistible. On thee I call, thee only I adore, despising the gods above. So he speaks, and himself fulfills his own prayer. And passage 7, book 10, 481 
to 486. Capanius cheers them on. Long enough, Pelasgians, has our valour lain in hiding. Now, now, is victory fair in my eyes, in the full blaze of day. On, men, with me to open conflict. Raise the dust and shout your battle cry. Sure is the omen of my right hand, terrible the fury of my drawn sword. Capania's battlefield career of evil is highlighted in passages 3 and 7. In passage 3, showing a certain amount of dementia by talking to his right hand, Capanius expounds his heretical theology. His own right hand is itself the Godhead, and the actual gods are objects of contempt. In passage 7, a book later, he continues in this provocative vein. Sunt et mihi proida dextri omina, which in the first translation I read was rendered I have prescient omens in my right hand. Well, whatever it means, Capanius is travestying religion. The portrait of Capanius' heresy climaxes in a scene which is hard to have a mental image of. He climbs up a sort of celestial ladder, elevating himself to a point where he's looking down on Thebes, and then starts shouting taunts at the gods, 10, 900. Jupiter shuts him up with a thunderbolt. So much for the portraits of hubristic evil. Now let's move to the scenes of pathos. Passage 4, Book 9, 690 to 699. The boy wore a cloak twice steeped in obalian dye and a glittering gold embroidered tunic. Only this had his mother woven, gathered about his waist by a slender girdle and burdened by a huge sword. He had let drop his shield on the left shoulder of his horse. The golden buckle of the belt that hangs by his armed side delights him with its polished clasp. And he joys to hear the rattle of the scabbard and the rustling murmur of the quiver and the sound of the chains that fall behind him from his crest. Sometimes he gaily tosses his flowing plume and his glancing jewel studded cask. In passage four, we have a description of the boy path and Apius in battle. What we are particularly looking at here may seem like the merest detail. He had let dropped his shield on the left shoulder of his horse, 9693. This is, however, part of a larger portrait of something that is capital NQR, not quite right. The basic idea underpinning the portrait is that the young shouldn't be in a war zone. In the battle, soon after this description of Parthenopeus, we are told that the Theban warriors yield him place, remembering their own sons. 9706. The Theban warriors are showing natural, instinctive understanding that Parthenopeus is too young to be an appropriate war target. The description of him in this passage emphasizes neoteny. His mother is involved with the clothes, 9619-2. The sword is too big, 9694. The horse he's riding is untrained for war, 9685. And he exhibits boyish or even childish excitement with his equipment. And right in the middle of a battle, 9694 in summary, the shield, which has been allowed to slip down the horse's left shoulder, functions as just one spicy detail among many in a portrait of an inappropriate state of affairs. Passage 5, Book 10, 304-310. Ealmanus had spent his last night in unsleeping merriment and with the lute, never to behold tomorrow's dawn, and was singing a Sidonian paean. Under the influence of the god, his languid neck sank leftward, and his lyre pillowed his drooping head. Through his breast, Agilius drives the blade and pierces the right hand that grasps the tortoise shell, and the fingers trembling among their well-known strings. If the depiction of Parthenopeus is a state of affairs that is not quite right, then the killing of Ealmanus, passage 5, and the massacring of the sleeping is moving into the territory of the capital DW 
disastrously wrong. The realm of behavior that cannot be, have one shred of heroism or glory in it. As a consequence, all our sympathies are directed towards the almanus, the head drooping leftward guitar player. Here left is probably to interpret it interpreted as extreme weakness and vulnerability. And the piercing of his right hand by the rampaging Agilius seems suspiciously like a crime against art. Passage 6, Book 10, 405 to 420. Dimas had turned and seen and knew that battle was joined and doubted whether to use arms or prayers against the oncoming foe. Wrath urges arms, fortune bids him try prayer, not daring. Neither resource brings confidence. Anger forbade entreaty. Before his feet he places the hapless body and flings on his left arm a heavy tiger's hide that he wore by chance upon his back. And holding out his bared blade, he stands on guard and turns to face every dart, prepared both to slay and to be slain. As a lioness lately whelped, beset by Numidian hunters in her savage lair, stands above her young, erect but doubting in her mind, and utters a wild and melancholy roar. Full well could she scatter their array and snap their weapons in her jaws, but love of her offspring overcomes the fierceness of her heart, and from the midst of her rage she looks round upon her cubs. And now the hero's left hand has been cut away. With passage six, Demis's defense of the body of Parthenopeus, I think we come to Statius at the very top of his sentimentalizing game. And we also come to a delicious piece of sociobiology. Demis's attempt to use his left arm tied in a tiger's hide to defend himself and the dead body of his uh, mate could be interpreted simply as a half-hearted defense born of indecision but it can also be seen as a sort of split brain effort as per the illustrative trope of the lioness with her cubs. Dimas's strategy should remind us of the modern idea of adopting left sidedness as the result of a neurological phenomenon of failing to lateralize. Or to put it another way, should remind us that ambilaterality is a fir flirtation with failing to be a live functioning prototypical human being. Passage 8, Book 11, 580 to 587. But the sire, when he knew the horrid deed was over, burst out from his gloom profound, and in the dread great gateway displays his living corpse. His grey hair and beard are filthy and matted with ancient gore, and locks congealed with blood veil his fury-haunted head. Deep sunk are his cheeks and eyes, and foul the traces of the sight's uprooting. The maid sustains his left arm that leans its weight upon her. His right is supported by a staff. Finally, passage eight. The horrid deed referred to here is the fact that Oedipus's sons and the principals in the war, Eteocles and Polynices, have killed each other. Oedipus, having started the war and thereby having set in train the events which have brought about the death of his own sons, is now in this scene merely an impotent, tragic, figure. Cursed, but commanding our sympathy. The use of left and right in this winding up of story tableau is very striking. Oedipus's right hand needs a walking stick because he is now a shell of a man. And is only his female offspring, Antigone, on his left, the weak side, that offers him any salvation. Conclusion. In this talk, in accordance with the credo of biological literary criticism, we tried to make sure we had a firm footing with modern scientific theory on the literary theme or motif to be investigated. In this case, it involved looking at the modern scholarship on left and right handedness. We looked at three theories, the two type view of left handedness, the theory of brain and sats, the pathological continuum in normal populations theory of left handedness of Paul Buchan and the studies it has generated and finally, Marion Annette's evolution accommodating right shift theory. In the normal course of events, one could now plunge straight into the text up for analysis. But we decided to add in an intermediate step to make sure we had some grasp of how people in antiquity actually understood handedness. 
The picture that emerges is that left and right handedness in the modern clinical sense is not understood by them at all. What is called today right handedness, the preferential use of the right hand, is for them behavior that is normal, healthy, sanctioned by the gods. What is called today left handedness, the preferential use of the left hand, is for them failing to be right handed and thereby failing to be normal, failing to be healthy and failing to be blessed by the gods. What people in antiquity do, however, understand is how left-handedness can function as per evolutionary game theory. They are quite capable of understanding the idea of left-handedness as a desperate minor option tactic adopted by the hard-pressed. Statius the Bayad, however, provides something of a special case. Statius uses left and right-sidedness partially as a straight moral superstructure where left equals bad and right equals good, but also as a sort of mixed moral and aesthetic currency in which he can conduct his trade in scenes of over-the-top hubris and over-the-top pathos. In Statius, the right stands for human strength and God-given power, but when relied on to excess denotes a pathological failing. The left is evil and ungodly, but can also denote a charming weakness a charming innocence. Thanks.